I'm sure you're aware of it, but you might not think of it very often, that having grocery stores bursting with food is not the typical experience of human history. You only have to go back a little while before food scarcity was a much more common thing. The second agricultural revolution began in the mid-17th century. The first agricultural revolution is the domestication of, uh, of both animals and plants that took place in ancient history. And farming was much the same until the mid-17th century through the 19th century. Uh, it was concurrent with the Industrial Revolution. New farming techniques began to be used primarily uh, in England, but also spreading to Europe and to America. Things like new ideas about crop rotation, land reclamation, and selective breeding. Things that uh, led to radically increased uh, harvests. There was also an a improvement in transportation systems and getting the harvest to the market and in uh, national markets and the ideas uh, of uh, getting rid of all of those tolls on every bridge and on every road so that people could get food where it needed to be. Later on, the third agricultural revolution occurred, uh, sometimes known as the Green Revolution, uh, in, our, uh, in our own era, in the 1950s and 60s, this was primarily the rest of the world, uh, the developing world, where high-yield cereal grains and fertilizers and irrigation techniques began to be used uh, in regular uh, ways. This led, again, to a massive increase in yields. In 1798, a man named Malthus wrote a book predicting that with the increase in human population, that famine, which would of course lead to wars and other ills, was inevitable. That there would be no way that farming could keep up with increases in population. He wrote that in 1798. A lot of people believed it. Believed it. Uh, however, by 1923, just 125 years after he wrote, the population of the world had doubled. That's a lot of extra people. And yet, his prediction had not come true. And again, between 1923 and 1973, just 50 years, the world's population doubled again. And of course, those increases have continued since the 70s. The numbers we are seeing, uh, people of the past would not have been able to fathom this many people. Yet production has been able to outpace population growth. In other words, the increase in the yields of food that is being produced in the world has grown faster than the number of people, which means that as a percentage, there is less population now than ever before. That in the modern world, less people are afraid of starving to death than in any time of our ancestors. The numbers are, of course, still alarming because there are still tens of millions of people in danger. But as a percentage of the whole, we have more abundance than ever before. And I'm sure you all understand that and you know that. So when we look at Psalm 65, we look at what David is writing thousands of years ago about the goodness of the Lord at the time of harvest. We have more reason for this thankfulness, not less than David, because our situation has improved, and yet he had a heart full of thankfulness. Let's look at the text. It begins with the first two verses. It says, Praise awaits you, our God, in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. David begins by saying that praise awaits you, God, in Zion. You see, the things that God has already done have built up a store of praise that God is owed, that is due to God before anything else, before prayer, before saying, help us with this, help us with that. We recognize that God has already done a host of things for which, we, uh, or for which he deserves praise, for which we are obligated to give God praise. Pa uh, 
David says, to, our vow, to you our vows will be fulfilled, you who answer prayer. And I find it interesting that he puts those two together, our vows and our prayers to God. You see, there's a connection between asking things of God and making commitments for God. The relationship that God would have with us is supposed to be a two-way street. God is happy to provide for His people, but He will not be simply our emergency plan, simply that thing we have on the wall that says, in case of emergency, break glass. That is not the role of God in our lives, waiting for our desperate prayers and not hearing from us and not being in a relationship with us otherwise. That is unacceptable to God. We have both obligations to God, represented there in our vows, and things to ask from God, represented in our prayers. David goes on to say, When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. I find that phrase, overwhelmed by sins, to be interesting. Have you ever been overwhelmed by your sins? Has it ever drawn you up so short that you felt desperate and hopeless? Has it ever been that insurmountable in your mind? That is the inevitable end to sin. It will always overwhelm and destroy us if allowed to reach its fullness. We are powerless against that conclusion on our own. Therefore, our only solution is what, what David says here. You forgave our transgressions. The only solution we have to being overwhelmed by our own sins. Because only God can do it. For against God are all sins ultimately directed. And only one who, has, who is himself holy can forgive those who are not. It does us no good to, in that sense, forgive each other because we are all sinners. We are all unholy. We are all unrighteous on our own. How can we forgive others who are just like us and have it fix the problem? So David thanks the Lord for forgiving our transgressions. He goes on to say, Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live you in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. These two ideas are connected together as well. The people that God chooses, he brings near. That is, of course, what God does when he chooses a people. When he calls people, he brings them to him. He does not leave them where they are. When God, inter uh, when God is involved in the lives of his people, it is to bring them near to him. That is, of course, an act of grace by God, something deserved by none, but given to so very many. And thus we are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. And I thought for a moment, what are those good things? What are the good things of the house of the Lord? They are simply things like forgiveness, reconciliation, healing, comfort, hope, fellowship, joy, love. These are the things which we find in the house of the Lord amongst the people of God, and these are no small things, in part because they are so rare outside these doors, because they are so hard to find in this world. So many people living without them, not knowing the good things of the Lord. David says, you answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the turmoil of the nations. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. David writing this at a time when many people still worshipped idols, when many people still walked, to still looked to these false gods to be their salvation, and yet none of them could answer. None of them could do anything, but God could be our Savior. What value do you have in a God who cannot save? 
If the God that you worship cannot save you from yourself, then you're wasting your time. And David says, thanks to God, our Savior, Savior, who has answered us with awesome and righteous deeds. Not with arbitrary things, not with unpredictable acts. That's if you read the mythology of the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, you read of their gods, they're completely arbitrary. You don't know where you stand with them. You don't know what to expect with them because they are just us writ large. They are just more powerful human beings. And they act like human beings with all of the vices and all of the pride and all of the anger and all of the things that humanity has. Yet God answers us with awesome and righteous deeds. Just looking back on the history of his own people, Abra er, David could have been thinking about when God chose Abraham and blessed him with the birth of Isaac. He could have been thinking about the protection of Joseph when his brothers sold him into slavery into Egypt, and then how in turn Joseph was able to save his own family from famine because God was with Joseph when he was a slave in Egypt. He could have been thinking about the calling of Moses and the judgment that God brought upon Egypt when he brought the people of Israel out. He could have been thinking about the crossing of the Red Sea, of the manna in the desert, of the law that was given at Mount Sinai, of the crossing of the Jordan, of the fall of Jericho, of his own life, his protection from the lions and the bears and the destruction of Goliath. Many things in the Word of God preserved of the awesome and righteous deeds of God, and those, of course, did not end with the time of David the rest of the Bible continuing the story, and then church history being filled with examples of the righteous and awesome deeds of God on the behalf of his people. David speaks of God as the hope of all the ends of the earth, because God is holy and righteous, as well as being loving and kind. There can be hope for humanity that will go to all the ends of the earth. Not simply the power and strength of God, but hope in that power. He says, the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Have you been in awe at the wonders of God? Sometimes that's what we go on vacation for, isn't it? Why we drive or fly somewhere far because we want to see some awesome wonders. Whether for you that's the oceans or the mountains or whatever that thing is. Maybe it's a cave. Who knows what that place is that you go to and just sit back and say, this is wondrous. You really don't have to go on vacation, take a hike out at Oil Creek State Park sometime. I do that quite frequently. There's some awesome stuff out there that can fill you with wonders. God is the creator and sustainer of this universe. We as mere mortals cannot help but feel awe when we think about our place in this vast universe. And thinking of that, remember that in all of that, God cares for us. When morning dawns, when evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Songs about the beauty of the earth and the continuation of, of life. Some of you are probably more likely to sing songs of joy in the morning, and some of you are not. And some of you would much rather, when the sun sets, sing songs of joy. You ever notice that they look the same? If, if you're not sure which direction the camera is facing, a picture of a sunset and a picture of the sunrise, pretty much the same. But I think some of us much prefer the sunset to the sunrise, do we not? When you wake up in the morning and the sun is just peeking up, are you singing songs of joy? Or are you saying, oh, another day, it's so early. I've been there. I used to get up at 6 a.m. every single day for school. It was horrible. Didn't enjoy it much, none at all. When the sun goes down, which today, what, like 4.30, right? 
uh, darkness, 445, something like that, uh, we will sing our songs of joy. The last section of David's psalm here. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. For so you have ordained it. You drench its furrow. Its, mm, let me try again. You drench its furrow, mm, furrows. That's hard to say out loud. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. You guys know this was originally a song, right? It was to a tune. It was supposed to be singable. Uh, that line, not so much, but of course it was written in Hebrew, uh, probably easier than here in English. He starts by saying, you care for the land. I think some people are under the mistaken impression that the earth and the universe is just kind of like a wind-up clock. God created the thing, gave it a nice click, you know, for this many years and said, all right, go. That's not the truth at all. God remains intimately involved in the ongoing continuation of the viability of life on earth. Astronomers, scientists wonder about the viability of life on this planet. They're looking for other planets where life might be viable. This peculiar mixture we have of a certain distance from uh, a sun that has a certain amount of heat to it, right? The rotational rate, the amount of water, the atmosphere, all of these things are necessary. But what is more necessary is God the ongoing will of God that this land, this planet, bring forth life abundantly and enrich it. David says, for so you have ordained it. This is the plan of God, and it is truly amazing if you stop and study and look at the intricate and interdependent world that we live in. We know a lot in the modern era about ecosystems, how just about everything that exists has a role and a purpose. Whether we appreciate that purpose or not, when we're dealing with bugs or a variety of things that you think these things have no purpose, we know about water cycles. We know about how everything is recycled on this world. Everything is reused in its amazing intricacy. This is no mere accident because no accident could work with such wonder. This is the ordained plan of God, the creativity of God to make this world as it is. And then the last line, they shout for joy and sing. God certainly deserves our praise and glory as we contemplate the goodness of of the earth, and especially at this harvest season when we once again contemplate the bounty of the earth. Three things to take away from Psalm 65. Number one, we ought to give God thanks for the forgiveness of our sins. We knew that one already. We're constantly thinking of that. That's an awesome one to keep in our minds. Secondly, give thanks to the Lord for answering the prayer of His people and we do that quite often. Thirdly, give thanks to the Lord for the productivity of the world that He created, that we might be blessed by its abundance.